Good evening. Uh, my name is Dale Wetzel. I'm the host of the Legislature Today radio show. We have uh, an interesting evening planned for you. First of all, we're going to be talking about North Dakota's grand jury law, how often it's used, and whether or not it should be changed. Uh, that is what we're going to be spending the first half hour on. The second half hour, we're going to be talking about uh, voter ID bills. We'll have the Secretary of State, Al Jagger, with us to uh, speak about those. First of all, let's uh, talk about uh, what went on in the legislature today. In the Senate, uh, the Senate approved a couple of military benefit bills. They provide $50,000 for military caskets for veterans who otherwise would get a welfare casket. That's the language of the bill. Also, uh, $50,000 for training service dogs for veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder. There was also approval of a 1% pension increase for employers and employees. I should say a pension contribution increase for employers and employees in, uh, for, uh, in January 2014 and January 2015. This affects the, uh, uh, a great deal of uh, North Dakota state government workers and uh, judges, district judges, and the uh, justices of the Supreme Court. The Highway Patrol and National Guard will see their pension uh, contributions go up one-half percent uh, in January 2014 and January 2015. There's, this is part of an ongoing program to try to improve the health of uh, state uh, government pension funds. There was quite a lot of uh, disagreement in the Senate today about whether this should be done, whether it amounts to uh, throwing good money after bad, and there was uh, attempts by both sides to appropriate the digging metaphor. Uh, are, we, are we digging ourselves into a hole that we can't get out of? And, uh, and the folks who uh, supported the increased contributions say, well, if we don't increase our contributions, then we're really going to be going to have a hole that we can't uh, get ourselves out of. There's a general argument as well that defined benefit plans, which uh, provide a guaranteed retirement benefit for folks, are obsolete in today's world and that we should have instead defined uh, contribution plans, which are like uh, 401k plans. Uh, in the House, there was uh, defeated a sales tax exemption for thrift stores. Um, the argument in favor of that was that uh, thrift stores, by definition, sell clothes that have already been sold once and taxed once, and therefore... You shouldn't have to uh, pay sales tax on used clothing. Uh, that was defeated. Uh, there was also uh, legislation that increases the penalties for presenting a false ID to buy alcohol and also for buying alcohol for someone who is underage. Uh, the minimum sentence now, if this uh, bill is approved by the Senate and signed by the governor, would be a $500 fine and 40 hours community service if you are an adult, uh, someone 21 years old or older, and, buy, and you buy alcohol for someone who is underage, or if you present a false ID to buy alcohol. There was also a uh, extended debate about whether to extend a moratorium on the growth of basic care and skilled nursing home beds. Uh, there was some discussion about whether the moratorium should apply to basic care beds. As it turned out, the House approved extending for two years a moratorium on the growth of both basic care, which is a, a lesser, requires less medical attention for the occupant of the bed, and skilled nursing home beds. The two-year moratorium was extended in both cases, and uh, this bill will go to the Senate uh, for additional work. And there was also uh, a, a bill about North Dakota's grand jury uh, law, and that's, one, that's what we're going to be talking about in our first half hour. We have with us uh, this evening the uh, sponsor of the bill, Representative Jim Casper. He's a Republican from Fargo. We have Representative Kim Koppelman, who is a Republican from West Fargo and the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee. We also have uh, Republic, uh, excuse me, uh, Representative Corey Mock, who is the Assistant House Democratic Leader, and he was uh, the leader of the opposition uh, in the House today as far as uh, the need, arguing against the need to change the grand jury law. Uh, Representative Casper, can you just explain to us what does the grand jury law do right now, and how did you want to change it? Well, Dale, thank you for having me here tonight. The grand jury law currently uh, allows a uh, grand jury to be called in a number of ways. Uh, the a judge can call a grand jury. The county commissioners can call a grand jury. 
and a, uh, a citizen panel by petitioning uh, with 10% signature of, signatures of the last vote for governor in the last election can call the uh, grand jury. And uh, it really, it's, it sort of can be called for almost any reason. And uh, the bill uh, amends some of those areas, which I'm sure we'll get into, and makes it uh, a little more uh, targeted about what, what the grand jury's purpose should be and when it can be impaneled. What should the grand jury's purpose be, sir? Well, Dale, I think uh, the grand jury should be looking at uh, criminal uh, offenses that are serious. Uh, not should, it should not be used for frivolous uh, political agendas, uh, for uh, personal vendettas, personal agendas, and things like that. And uh, that's the concern that I had when, when uh, the bill was introduced. The, uh, interesting, the uh, state's attorneys uh, were working on a bill that would have abolished the grand jury. And uh, they were going to introduce it. And in fact, they asked me to introduce the bill. And I said, well, gee, I've got the bill here that's going to amend the law in the way that, that my bill currently does, uh, with the amendments put on in, in Representative Koppelman's committee. And when they saw my bill, they said, well, you know, we'll get on board on your bill and, and, and support that, which, which is what they're doing. Can you tell me, how, how long has this grand jury law been around, and how often does it get used? Well, it's been around, uh, Dale, I believe, since before statehood. Yeah, it's been used very seldom, but it's been here for well over 100 years. Uh, Representative Mock, uh, you essentially argued in the, in the, on the House floor uh, this afternoon that this law does not need to be changed. Uh, why do you make that argument? Well, and Dale, and, and, and you know, Representative Casper was, you know, was right. This is a law, the grand jury law has been on the books since, 19, or since 1877. And, and the provision that's being changed, I think, the most uh, uh, noticeably is the, uh, the, the ability to petition to convene a grand jury. And in 1890, that provision was put into our, our law, uh, and it was amended in 1905 to where it is today. You know, that 10 percent of the, of, the of the number of people in that county that had voted in the last gubernatorial election. So if you had uh, 1,000 votes for governor in that county, you would need 100 signatures to petition for uh, for a grand jury. Uh, this is not a section of law that has been really used much and therefore, as is, is you can say, has never been misused. It, it, is a, uh, it was put into place uh, so that citizens have a right to, uh, to call for an investigation when the prosecuting attorney fails to do so. It was uh, it's a popular law that existed in many states. Uh, now there are five states that have this law in the books. There are two that have it in their constitution. North Dakota is one of those five, and, and by, by changing it to a threshold that is virtually non-existent anywhere else in law, 40%, uh, it, it has virtually rendered the section of law uh, moot. It, it is something that uh, is a high threshold. It uh, uh, I will wager a bet that uh, very few times we'll, we'll, we'll see a petition be circulated uh, to, uh, to convene a grand jury, especially as a result of, of uh, uh, 1451. Uh, has this law been used recently? There has been no uh, grand jury convened as a result of, of a petition. Uh, from my has, research there been, has there been one requested? I, I, I'm not sure. I, I, I think there, there have been attempts, or there may have been attempts, but I, 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 the, the, the most recent one I'm aware of that's been actually convened was in 1929. And that was the time when, a, when citizens petitioned. It was in Burley County, and they convened a grand jury. And that was a case that eventually went up to the Supreme Court. Uh, Representative Koppelman, your committee considered this bill. Why did you think it was uh, necessary? Well, uh, Dale, good to be with you again. Um, very interesting bill. And I think, uh, you know, it's interesting because the job of any legislative committee, I believe, is to look at public policy, to look at our law as it stands in the books. When we get bills, by definition, they are either to introduce new laws that we don't have or amend current laws that we have, change them. And so that's how we looked at this, at this particular issue. And uh, as has been already uh, explained by both other members of the panel here, the grand jury laws have been on the books for a long time. I think Representative Mock said today, uh, 1890 on the floor, I was told before statehood. So he's doing more research in 1877. Sounds about right. It's been a long time. Uh, yeah, 1889 was statehood. So, But at any rate, um, so he's been busier than I have since the floor session. But at any rate, the, uh, the grand jury laws, as, as, it, as we've talked about already, are seldom used. question is, do we need them at all? Representative Casper said that the uh, state's attorneys were we're uh, coming to the conclusion that we don't because it's just something we don't do in North Dakota. Uh, we decided as a committee that it wasn't good to uh, eliminate them altogether. 
We also thought there were some problems with the bill as it came to us. Uh, we didn't necessarily agree with everything Representative Casper proposed. So I appointed a bipartisan subcommittee, uh, consisted of Representative Brabant, who chaired the committee, also Representative Kretschmar, who is the former chairman of the Judiciary Committee, uh, longest serving member of the House of Representatives, an attorney by profession, so very well schooled in the law. And a hell of a smart guy. He's too. a great, he's a great guy. And uh, and Representative Hansen, who is a very smart young freshman from uh, the minority party. And they were on that subcommittee together. They did yeoman's work. They worked very hard on this. I was very proud of them as the chairman of the committee. And I think they came back to the committee with a very good product. So we recommended passage of the bill. And, uh, uh, and I think it basically brings the... Uh, the statute up to date in a way that modernizes it and makes it workable in the cases where it might be needed. What was the logic of having 40 percent of the total vote in the county for governor? Well, you know, that, 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 that is a high threat. You know, that was, it is. And that was something that we discussed and deliberated, the subcommittee at least discussed and deliberated pretty heavily. And we discussed it in the committee when they brought their suggested amendment back to us. I think, and Representative Mock just made the uh, the comment that uh, the threshold in the bill, the 40 percent, is something that doesn't exist anywhere else in law. I, that may, that's probably true. I don't know. Uh, but I don't think 10 percent exists anywhere else in law either. And so the question is, should a 10 percent threshold trigger a mechanism or a process that can deprive someone of their liberty? That's a pretty high standard. The purpose of a grand jury primarily is to accuse someone of a crime, to indict someone. I the threshold. Ahead, well, I was just going to say the yeah. threshold for a recall, for example, if uh, if Representative Mock's constituents don't think he's doing a good job or don't like his politics or for whatever frivolous reason, they could mount a petition drive. And if it was signed by 25 percent of the voters for governor in the last election, he'd be on the ballot again with a recall. So would any of us. Uh, we in the committee believed that the threshold for potentially losing your job should be considerably less than the threshold for potentially losing your freedom. OK, the um, I, I read the grand jury law. It's 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 five pages long and. There's two questions that came to my mind, two primary questions that came to mind that I would like all three of you gentlemen to address. First of all, it wasn't clear to me who runs the grand jury uh, in this uh, law, and it also isn't clear to me if the, if the grand jury's authority extends outside the county in which it's meeting. And I'd, I'd like all three of you to tell me what your interpretation of that is. Uh, and could, you, could I start with you, uh, Representative Mock, please? We certainly can, and, and you know the grand jury law. It's you know, and I have to you know full disclosure. I am not an attorney. I, I, I merely play one on the floor of the house when Representative Koppelman and I go back and forth on questions. So, uh, so I'm, I am uh, not an attorney. Uh, you know the grand jury law. It is is very specific and, and, and allows that a judge that right now a board of or the county commissioners or a petition can convene a grand jury, uh, and that uh, that it can it can be used uh, really for for two sections, and that's to. Uh, I get my section here hey, uh, to uh, to investigate or inquire into the condition and management of our public prisons, or to uh, to investigate willful and corrupt misconduct of in office of pu public officials. Uh, generally, it's it's used at the county level, and that's that's with uh, with state's attorneys. And the reason for that is if a state's attorney, uh, which is the the lead prosecuting attorney in every county, if they fail to act, this is the citizen's way of convening a jury to uh, to investigate the uh, the accusation. Yeah, what I wasn't clear about is who once the grand jury is formed, who runs it, who calls the shots. Is that clear in the law? Do you think? It's a state's attorney. Well, and, and, and in the law, well, the it, law it, doesn't say that, though. I don't think that the it, state's it, attorney. It says that the grand jury comes to the state's attorney for advice, but it doesn't say the state's attorney runs it. Dale, I, you know, I'm, I'm just glancing at the law here, and my gleaning, and I, I first read this entire statute this morning. We've read, of course, the sections that the bill seeks to amend, but uh, the entire statute. It, it, it seems to me that the court can make direction to the grand jury. The court certainly impanels the court, meaning a judge, certainly mm -hmm. impanels the grand jury. Mm -hmm. The grand jury can call upon the prosecuting attorney for uh, assistance and and uh, uh, advice and so on. But the grand jury is, essentially runs itself. It's a freewheeling uh, operation. Is if that is that a plus or is that a bug or a feature? Well, I think it's all right. I mean, uh, you know, the petition, if, if the petition process is what called a grand jury or, or created, uh, did, made the call for a grand jury, the way I read the law, whether it's current law or as the law would be amended in this bill, is that a judge would be the one to impanel the grand jury. In other words, select the people that serve on the grand jury. And then they appoint a, a clerk or a reporter, a recorder, and uh, I assume a, a foreman and, or chairman and whatever, and they run they run their operation. Representative Casper, one of the things I noticed <coughs> about your bill is that your bill is explicit that the state's attorney 
runs the grand jury mm -hmm. and, and takes charge of it. And I was wondering if one of the one of your objectives of introducing the bill is to make clear who does indeed run the grand jury well, once it's formed. Well, I, I think it is, Dale, because when when you have a, a grand jury with with the power and the authority that it has. I believe that the, the person that should be at the head of the grand jury should be someone who has a uh, legal background, and that's the state's attorney. Uh, this does, the state's attorney can sort of moderate and be the chairman, but the power of what the grand jury does is vested in the grand jury, the members of the grand jury themselves. So the state's attorney, after the grand jury makes their decision, then the state's attorney will have to implement. Uh, but someone has to, when they get together, has to say, okay, here's the rules, here's the law, here's what we need to do, here's, here's what you can do, here's what you can't do according to the law. And, and so the grand jury does its job in the most effective and efficient way possible. Could you comment on the 40% threshold? Why, is, why should it be so high, in your opinion? I think I have to echo what Rep Representative Koppelman said, Dale. The, when a grand jury is called, uh, it's looking at, at potential serious charges. And uh, if they're serious charges, you should have a number of people in, in, in the county say, we want to look at it. I think, uh, uh, I've been told that during testimony, a, a young lady came forward and said, well, I just want the committee to know that there's currently six other grand jurors being uh, looked at right now, the signatures being gathered out there. You know, that's, that's certainly the right of the citizens to do that. Don't get me wrong. But in the same token, my concern is, is that a, an individual or a group of individuals' political agenda could be driven by a grand jury being impaneled. And, I, and I'm saying, if you're going to impanel a grand jury, you, you better get enough signatures to have a lot of people say it, it's, it's worthy of a grand jury in, indictment, and that's, that's why I feel that the 40% is better. Representative Mock, what do you think of that reasoning? Well, first of all, there's, there's two other ways in which a grand jury can be convened, and, and they certainly are not immune to any political influences. And right now, it's by, the, by county commissioners or by a judge, and it's, it's, it could be one individual's actions and desire to convene a grand jury to investigate any one of those, those accusations, and that puts that same, uh, that same individual's uh, uh, life and freedom, as it's been said, in jeopardy. We also have have, uh, have a, a very thorough judicial system. You know, keep in mind that this is a grand jury. There's, even if they come to the conclusion and have six of the eight members of a grand jury reach a verdict and, and indict the individual, charges still may not be filed, and that individual has the the, the, the very judicial system that we're so proud of, of being Americans, uh, working for them. That you are always innocent until proven guilty. So you have two other means by which this can be convened, and even though that the threshold is, is, is seems to be implied, you know, reasonably low, uh, it has only been uh, used one time, and that was in 1929, that we can find that it's been successfully convicted excuse me, successfully convened where an indictment has, has ensued. And I also want to point out one other thing, and this is something we haven't talked about. Maybe we'll talk about it here in the next, in the last couple minutes. But it also removes the authority of the, of the grand jury to investigate misdemeanors. And, and, and when, it, when talking about the, the misconduct of an elected official, the majority of the, of the laws that, uh, that, that that would apply to a public official are misdemeanors. So, and this says that now it can only be felonies. So uh, simply not doing your job as an elected official, failure to act and, and, and comply with your legal responsibility, that's a misdemeanor. Selling your services as an elected official to a non-government employee and providing consultation services ag against the law, that's a misdemeanor. So that, uh, that is taken out of this. That's something that the grand jury will no longer be able to investigate. One, one thing that should, one thing that bears mention here is that there was an attempt to convene a grand jury last year during the campaign for governor. In Dun, there's a group of Dunn County residents who collected signatures on a petition because they believed that the fact that Governor Dalrymple, a Republican candidate, uh, had accepted contributions from the oil industry, that this uh, amounted to uh, corruption. And they wanted to impanel a grand jury to look into this question. Now that petition was thrown out because it didn't have enough signatures uh, and they have they the folks who believe in this process have since filed another petition and i think that that's uh, what was being referred to earlier about in terms of the, the possibility of frankly of political mischief in this process and uh Ms. representative casper was that one of your frankly one of your inspirations for introducing this bill well, Dale, my inspiration was, was as a result of learning what was going on in that particular situation and learning what the law said. And I, and I felt when you're, when you're making a serious accusation like the grand jury has the potential to do, that more than just a handful of uh, citizens with signatures ought to be required. 
I don't uh, dispute at all that there could be malfeasance and, and uh, areas out there where officials ought to be indicted. But I think there has to be a, a little larger group of citizens that say, you know, you're right, and then hear the facts and the evidence before they're willing to sign a petition to a panel of grand jury. Representative Koppelman, you mentioned that you, you, you said you weren't aware of any of this. Uh, when I, I was not, and I can't speak for our entire committee, but uh, I was not aware of any of it. Uh, I didn't know what the bill was about. I thought it was just a clean-up bill for grand juries, and that's the way I've tried to approach it the entire time. And I think that's important for us as elected officials, as people elected by the people of North Dakota, by our respective districts to make law. I think it's our responsibility to be uh, dispassionate, can, you know, uh, detached from some of these uh, things that might be going on and look at the law before us, look at the proposed changes before us and make good judgments on those. I do need to correct a couple things, though. First of all, Please. under current law, uh, as I read it, uh, the county commissioners of a county cannot, uh, of their own volition, um, create a grand jury. What happens is if there is a petition uh, that comes to them to create a grand jury, they can do that. Uh, now, the, the Association of Counties, or I should say the uh, the uh, State's Attorneys Association came to the committee with an amendment to Representative Casper's bill, which we adopted, and part of that amendment was to remove that and put the State's Attorneys in that position. I think that's a good move because the county commissioners have nothing to do with, with uh, legal, just, or legal process and criminal justice. And uh, secondly, uh, it seems like a lot of attention is being placed on the investigation of public officials, which is also a very, a one, literally one line in a thick statute, uh, so it's a very small part of what grand juries are about. But think about that situation for a moment. Should count, if, a, if a charge were to be brought against a public official like a county commissioner, would you want the county commissioners involved in calling the grand jury? I don't think so. I think the prosecuting attorney makes a lot more sense. So uh, I think the cleanup that has been done is, uh, is good, it's helpful, it might need a little more work in the Senate, and that's how the process works. Representative Mock, anything to say? Yeah, well, you, we've said quite a bit, and, I, and I, you know, I'm sure at the end of this, you know, we're going to agree to disagree. But I, you know, as far as cleanup language goes, you know, changing a state's attorney from uh, from board of county commissioners, you know, if that's considered cleanup language, then then that may bend. But the bill does significantly more than that. It changes the threshold. Uh, it, it removes the ability to investigate even misdemeanors. Uh, so yeah, I think there's a lot more work on this bill that needs to be done. We're talking to Representative Corey Mock, a Democrat from Grand Forks, and the Assistant Democratic House Leader. We also have our guests, our Representative Jim Casper, a Republican from Fargo and the sponsor of the bill we're talking about, and also Representative Kim Koppelman of West Fargo, the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee. Thank you, gentlemen, all of you. This is Dale Wetzel. I'm the host of the Legislature Today radio show. We're coming to you tonight live from the Peacock Alley, American Bar and Grill in downtown Bismarck, North Dakota. If you're out uh, cruising around and wondering why you're doing that uh, in, on such a cold night, what you should do is uh, come visit the Peacock Alley and have some, uh, some uh, refreshment in, our, in the bar or the restaurant. It's a wonderful place to sit and converse with friends, have a drink, have a nice meal. Uh, on the second half hour of our show, we're going to be talking about um, some election bills, specifically those that deal with whether you need to bring a identification, a photo identification, uh, to the polls to vote on, on election day. Uh, presently, we, ha we have as our, um, as our guests, we have the Secretary of State, Al Jager. We also have uh, Representative uh, Steve Zeiser. He's a Democrat from Fargo. And one of the, uh, two of the bills actually that I wanted to uh, speak about was have to do with, uh, with uh, using photo ID to vote. Um, Secretary Jager, right now, I'm coming in to vote. I don't have my ID. I don't have a photo ID. I have no ID of any kind. What happens to me? How can I vote? Well, actually, there's a couple different ways. Uh, if you come in without any identification, the first thing would be as if one of the poll workers actually knows you and will vouch for you. And if they know you and they do that, you're allowed to vote. Uh, if you uh, don't have somebody that can vouch for you, then you can uh, fill out a voter's affidavit. And uh, that you do under, under penalty of law and perjury if uh, you indicate that you are who you are, you live where you say you live, and you're 18 years of age, uh, you fill that out, you sign it, and you're allowed to vote. Under that particular process, your ballot is then put in with all of the rest of the ballots. And what happens if... Um if later on your affidavit is checked and it's determined that you're not eligible to vote? 
Well, the voter probably would uh, face, uh, uh, face some penalty. Uh, because uh, it does say on the affidavit that there's a pretty severe fine. I believe it's up uh, $2,000 or something in that order. But the the ballot, uh, there was there's no way to identify it. You, in other words, you can you can vote, you can sign an affidavit, you can vote. Your vote is counted, even if you're it's later determined that you're not eligible. That's correct. So how would I'm how would these there, there's two bills I wanted to speak about. One is uh, uh, about this subject. Mm-hmm. One of them is uh, House Bill 1332. The other is House Bill 1275. And actually, Dale, there's another one, 1418, about yes. the same subject. So okay. there's three of them actually about the same subject. But, but they, are, they, all, they all are related to the same topic. And can you tell us what do these bills do that change the uh, status quo? Well, the way they were originally um, introduced... Uh, uh, we had some concerns because uh, essentially well, what the concern is that we had a little over 10,000 voter affidavits in the last general election. And that's a concern. Uh, we do have a procedure in law where we follow up. Uh, but again, as you just said, that if somebody is found to have uh, been uh, an unqualified elector, the ballot is in there. And so the concern is that when the people come in and, and and uh, execute a voter's affidavit that what they they would do then is that ballot would be put away in a secrecy envelope and held. Uh, and then the way two of the bills were written is that sometime during the past, in the following week before the state canvassing board would meet, the people would have to come back in and show some type of identification. And uh, we saw a lot of, lot of concerns and problems with that because... Uh, uh, you know, there's 10,000 people that would be coming back in, or they may not come back in, and depending on uh, the results of the election, which everybody would know, uh, there could be a lot of a lot of concerns about that. And so, essentially, what these bills are now doing uh, would be is that uh, when you come in, you need to have identification uh, up front, uh, and if you don't have the identification, then you don't. You aren't, you aren't allowed to cast your vote. Representative Zeiser, what do you think about that approach? Well, I think it's better than the previous affidavit approach, but I don't like it. I guess the election is probably everybody's most sacred thing, and it's one thing that sets this country, amongst others, apart from most countries the right to vote without being impeded in any way. And I believe that having an ID that's issued, you can only issued by the state, a state approved ID really provides a deterrent to the poor, to students, to people that live in senior homes of some sorts. They can get them. But oftentimes those people aren't familiar with the ways and the processes that makes it easier for the rest of us to get them. And the Brennan Center out of NYC, New York City, um, has basically said that up to 11% of the people from their studies that they've done were not able to vote this last, last presidential election because of voter IDs. And in fact, 37 states passed new voter IDs laws, um, and a number of them were actually determined to be unconstitutional. Now, North Dakota wasn't one of those. I guess that test would come if this bill were to become law, if somebody were to decide that it may or may not be constitutional. But it does put a heavier burden on those that, I guess, to be very honest, partisan are more apt to vote Democrat, are less apt to, are more apt to be affected by this. Uh, Elderly, poor people, uh, minority races, people in a senior home, um, those kinds of things. And for that reason, and the other thing, the vouchering, having some poll worker to vouch for who you are no longer is acceptable under these new bills um, that was eliminated as well. Well, actually, Dale, uh, on 12, in 1275, uh, that 
that really bill just changes that you have to provide identification. We would still, uh, under that bill, uh, all of the variety of uh, identification that we accept now would be accepted. So, uh, you know, essentially, uh, it's a, it can be a combination. You need to have your name attached to some kind of residency and also be able to provide your birth date. And so on 1275, uh, you would still have the uh, vouching, you would still have the, uh, you know, all of the different types of identification that we uh, accept now. And the fact is, is that uh, about 93% of the people already uh, provide like a, like a driver's license or something like that. On 1332, uh, somewhere along the line, and, and I believe Representative Baining was uh, working to get that out, uh, there was a photo ID requirement, but that, I believe, is being removed uh, because that was never the intent of the sponsors of that bill up front. And we caught it, and we brought it to their attention, and so I believe that is in the process of being removed. Uh, there, that bill more requires that there be some type of uh, state identification, and that's why it's going through appropriations, because uh, for those people that, that are, are not drivers, they would be able to obtain that uh, free of charge, and it wouldn't require a photo. Representative Zeiser, uh, you mentioned that you don't care for the affidavit process. Mm -hmm. Did I understand you correctly? I was just, I was just wondering, what sort of uh, identification do you think is appropriate for someone who wants to vote, or do you think that they should need to present any identification? Well, I think in an ideal wor world, identification is best. But in some cases, and I guess I've heard stories of, and this maybe applies to the larger cities in other other states, not as, but I think it applies also to Fargo, where there are, Fargo's getting to be a large enough town, small city, that it's difficult to get around and get out to DOT to get an ID, or people use the bus and they run out of time. I, I think the affidavit, I agree with the secretary's position that the fact that the vote was counted to retrieve it was just a nightmare. I mean, it made it an impossible situation. You wouldn't know how that person voted. And the only way would be to identify that vote, and that would be uh, violating an individual's privacy. So I would concur that that was not a good process. I just do not, I just think it really negatively deters a certain groups of people, a socioeconomic class that's one that we don't often talk about or really deal with in the legislature. And it's the poorest of the poor. So should they have to bring any identification at all? Or, or, and if so, what sort of identification should be appropriate in your judgment? Correct me, I'm, I mean, the secretary is probably more familiar with. Right now, do the bills call for an address and a birth date to be associated with, with any identification? Well, yes, that's a requirement of state law. You have to be U.S. citizen, 18 years of age, and have lived in the precinct for at least 30 days. And, and neither of those bills eliminates that. That still would be the criteria. And so, uh, as I said, in 1275, we would still accept all of the different types of identification that are available now. And then also, uh, we have to keep in mind that there are voting options like voting absentee, which hasn't gone away. So people can uh, can still vote by absentee ballot, too. So uh, that's still an option. It would be only when you come to the polls. That, that is where the voter's affidavit comes into play, and that's the concern. That ballot gets mixed in with everybody else's ballot, and that's where the concern lies. So, Secretary Jager, do you believe that there should be a requirement that someone bring a photo ID or some kind of state-issued ID to the polls on election day in order to be allowed to vote? Well, first of all, I don't agree that it should be a photo ID. Okay. Uh, um, that, I think, is... Uh, and I, I don't sense that there's any feeling in the legislature that that should be a requirement. In fact, the... And why, why not? Uh, I think it, it goes back to... Uh, 
the what probably Representative Zeiser is getting at, it might exclude some people that are unable to receive, uh, you know, uh, obtain a photo ID. Uh, the the bill that's going through, or 1332, if it, that one goes through, they led the there would be funding provided to DOT to provide uh, identification cards at no charge. Uh, I do believe that uh, because of the the questions that are raised with a voter's affidavit and that ballot being mixed in, that we need need to do something. The the way these two of these bi- three bills started out is that they were going to be held, and that didn't make any sense to us. The fact is, is if they're held or not held, the voter still needs to provide identification. And, and to us, from a voter administration standpoint, that's very important. Uh, you know, you, you, to vote in North Dakota, we don't have voter registration. We rely on, on identification. And... Uh, we don't want to go the voter registration route because uh, I have 49 colleagues out there that are having all kinds of problems with it and uh, in North Dakota. You're referring and, to the county auditors. Well, actually. Uh, oh, excuse uh, me. You're referring to the other secretaries of state. Excuse yeah. Me. I yes. mean, uh, 49 states have, yeah. have voter registration and, and they have a lot of challenges. I go to conferences and I hear about all the problems that they have. And so uh, so the, the idea of, of these bills is that you need identification, and, and why have them come back in three, four days, you know, uh, get it up front? So, go ahead, I'm sorry. If I, if I might ask, though, in, from my perspective, isn't a voter ID essentially voter registration? You're, you're registering, you know, you're identifying yourself, you're registering, it's same-day registration, but isn't it? It in fact registration. Well, I don't think it is. It's a, it's a matter of, of coming and and showing identification, and uh, you're allowed to vote. And uh, your name is entered into a poll book, which is a record of who has voted. And so, uh, it's really a different process because, uh, like Minnesota, they have what they call same day registration. But mo- in most states, you have to do it like 30 days ahead of time, and you have to do all of that. And we take the position that if you have lived in your precinct for 30 days, you're a U.S. citizen and 18 years of age, all of those people in North Dakota are eligible to vote. They don't need to register. They're all eligible to vote. As long as they bring the identification, that matches up to that. And and I applaud North Dakota and the secretary for taking that position. I mean, I would be horrified if we went back to pre-registration and having those long waits 30-day pre-registration time frame. But I still have problems with deterrence. I just want to make sure I understand uh, what your position is, uh, Secretary Jagger. You're, if I understand you correctly, you believe that a person should have to bring an ID to the polling place to vote, that that should be a requirement, although it does not have to be a photo ID. That's correct. And okay. it doesn't necessarily... Uh, you know, if if the one if thirteen thirty two passes and that's it, that's fine. But you know, right now the way the law is, it has worked for us in, in, in accepting a variety of identification to come up with the three essential elements that we need. What do you think the sense of the legislature is in terms of whether the legislature, regardless of what your opinion might be, whether the legislature is willing to approve a requirement for an ID? A state-issued ID or a state-issued photo ID? Well, I do know that the feedback that I receive is that the voter's affidavit is a huge problem. There's, a, there's an overwhelming concern, I think, on, uh, and even Representative Zeiser here has alluded to that. So if that is the concern, then we need to figure out how do we handle it. And the initial solutions to handling it, uh, in our mind, from just the voters and I, we, we saw so many problems with people coming back and the fact that the results of an election would be known already and then people may or may not come back but if it's a close election people are going to find out who voted and who didn't vote and, and wh- whose ballot is being held and I, I, I just see a, a big nightmare and so just to have it up front it's clean, simple 
This is one. This is uh, something that doesn't have to do directly with photo ID or voter identification. It has to do with when you can vote before the election. Uh, one of the bills that's being considered would shorten the time period by which you could go into a, uh, an early voting precinct mm. and vote. And could you, uh, Secretary Jagger, explain how you can vote early now at a voting center and what the proposal is to shorten that time frame to well, uh, whether, when you can uh, vote early? And what well, you think right now, I believe it, under state law, it's like uh, uh, counties uh, can make a des decision on their own to have a voting center, and I believe they can open up uh, up to 12 days earlier. The, right now, we have seven counties that do it. Uh, the voters in that in those counties really like it. Uh, we know between the early vote uh, centers, absentee voting, vote by mail. Uh, over 30% of the vote in the last election was cast before Election Day. I wanted to ask both you and uh, Representative Zeiser this question. Why do you think that there, there have been attempts to shorten this early voting window? And why do you think that there is that uh, obsession, frankly, is too strong a word, but why do you think that there is this desire to shorten the window for early voting when it is quite obviously uh, popular? I think it has to do with uh, campaigning. I think it's I think it's what the candidates experience, uh, particularly in the legislative le level, where they go out and knock on doors and they find out, well, we voted already. And all of the arguments that I've heard about it in committee, in fact, I believe these bills were in front of the committee that Representative Zeiser uh, is on, or or uh, political subs, one of the two. But but it all relates to the fact of of people having voted al already and it, it's, it's impacting campaigns. And what I find ironic about that is since that, that we've done away with no excuse absentee voting, both political parties, all candidates, uh, everybody is encouraging their people to vote early, and then you have people come in and say we're supposed to shorten the time, and I, I find that kind of a, an odd contrast. Representative Zeiser, what do you think about this attempt to shorten the amount of time that's available to vote early? Well, I think it's, to be frank, wrong. Uh, and I guess I think uh, the reason for it is to, again, be very frank, I think it's political. It's been shown that uh, Democrats vote early in much larger numbers than do Republicans. Generally, Republicans, and this is a stereotype, but are more affluent and are able to get to the polls on election day. Oftentimes, people that vote or maybe lean or tend to vote Democratic maybe has a day off a week and maybe their only day off in a matter of two weeks time is Saturday afternoon and that's the only time they can vote so it's my feeling and the feeling of, of many others that this is politically motivated that to reduce the amount of time the front end time you can vote early like I like the secretary has said it's a everybody <coughs> you talk to from people that vote to candidates seem to like it but when it comes to then changing the laws things become a little different and uh, for instance uh, I had one close race and I was actually behind after election night and then they counted the early vote and I won by quite a bit because it just so happens a lot of people voted early mm -hmm. for me. And, and I, I think it brings out anything to get a higher number of people to the polls, I'm for. And I think that should be the bottom line. And I think, for the most part, the secretary has done a good job at that. That's his primary, or that's his, one of his big jobs. And I think the kinds of things he's advocating minus I think this ID which is a deterrent if you come from a nursing home you don't maybe have a social security number you've lost it years ago you don't have a driver's license you never they don't give you a ride out to DOT 
I mean, or if you're a student, it is difficult to get those IDs. And you don't have a, you don't pay for your uh, heating bill because it's all part of the package. So there are people that are clearly impacted by the IDs. But I think the whole idea, again, the reason for shortening it up is really quite silly. The reasons I've heard is that they run into somebody that says, I already voted. Well, you just move on to the next door. Is it also, isn't that a kind of a way, I would imagine that that's a response given to by people who maybe they've voted already and maybe they haven't, but, you know, they just don't want to deal with talking to a political candidate at that time. So, oh, I already voted. It's like it's the equivalent of I, I gave at the office. Well, I think the example in the committee gave said that, uh, oh, if I would have known about you before, I would have voted for you. So that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's cruel, isn't it? <laughs> Uh, Secretary Jagger, we have a minute left, and I was wondering, there is a bill that would allow you to postpone an election for as much up to 30 days if there's a state of disaster or emergency. Mm -hmm. What's been the feedback you've gotten about that? Well, uh, it was presented to the committee, and I don't know exactly where it's at right now. I think they had some questions about it. But the thing is, is that uh, we've been encouraged to do this for a long time, uh, particularly by the uh, Federal Voting Assistance Program, which is a part of the Department of of Defense. And uh, uh, so that we could have those kind of provisions. And it it kind of came to light, particularly with the uh, storm situation last fall with the uh, uh, general election. Uh, This is something that is the way the law is written, there would have to be a declaration. The governor would have to be involved. It's something that I just couldn't automatically do. Uh, We haven't had any case that I know of where we would have used it. I would hope that we never have to use it. But the day comes when you need it, and you don't have it, and you can't do it, that's not good either. We've been talking to uh, Secretary of State Al Jager. He's been the Secretary of State since he was elected in 1992, if I'm remembering correctly. That's correct. Uh, He is a Republican, and uh, he's been one of our guests this evening. The other guests we've been talking to about are... Early voting and voter ID has been Representative Steve Zeiser. He's a Democrat from Fargo. And uh, uh, we've had an interesting conversation this evening, gentlemen. Uh, Thank you for your time, and uh, we hope to see you both again sometime. Thank you.